the J Files. Okay, well, let's uh, get into Tom York's High Five. I got to speak to the singer of Radiohead uh, when they were in Sydney and I got him to pick five songs that changed his life. So we'll get to that in just a moment. I actually started by uh, talking to Tom about the year ahead for Radiohead. What did 1998 look for, uh, look like happening for the band? And we began by talking about the Grammys, which the band is scheduled to be appearing at later this month. No, we pulled out of that. They said that we weren't good for the ratings. So we said, okay. You serious? Yeah, yeah. It was cool. We, we, we were so happy, man. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> We, we 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 kind of we kind of went into it going yeah, it'd be quite interesting to sort of go go on to and play exit music in front of a lot of people who just won't get it at all and then saying hope we hope that you choke and walk off the stage but given the context of it I think actually it probably wouldn't even even that wouldn't translate and and then and then they just started saying things like well we don't think you're appropriate really because you you know lower the ratings we're like fine thanks very much. Even though you are nominated in like major categories, like best album yeah. of the year. Yeah, but then, but then you know, the way those things work, it's like they probably just go and ask whoever's the tastemaker in New York that particular day, in that particular year, who probably has the attention speed of a gnat on speed, and, and and ask him, you know, what he thinks. You know, it's all it's all bullshit anyway. Once it once it gets to that level, it's like it's got nothing to do with the music at all. So, but you know, if um. And it's not it's not voted for by um, people who actually buy the records. You know, the people who vote for them was the ones who get them free anyway. So, so I take it you're not even going to make an appearance at the thing anyway. No, they were asking us to. Um, I think, well, do you want to go up and get, present some present an award to somebody else? I'm like, um, and what does that what serve, what purpose does that serve? You know, you should have said no. Sorry, we'll lower the ratings. We don't yeah, want yeah. to. <laughs> well, yeah. I have to get a face mask, face uh, face pack or something before I go on. Okay. All right. Well, if that's scrubbed off the schedule, then after that, um, when when do you think you'll start work on the next album? Um, no idea. We're not. We're not discussing it. It's just we're we're going to walk away from this, and uh, and then when we can't stand it anymore, maybe we'll start work. But that could be a year. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not. Uh, um, not necessarily convinced that we'll do another one before uh, the year 2000, necessarily. That's still a fair way. That's, you know, two years away. Yeah, but it's like the end of a cycle, really, for us. And and if we don't, if we don't attempt to integrate ourselves into real life again now, then that's it. You know, we never will, really. We'll just carry on doing this and turn, you know, and just turn into monsters. So the next couple of years, but I believe that, that like, I, I was reading that five songs are already written, possibly for the next album. You've got sort of, sort of songs hanging in the hanging in the air. We we could go and do it. We could go and do it tomorrow if you're talking about the actual material. But that's not really it. That's not really the point. It's more about what 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 sticks with us and what takes on significance. Like um, like you have a song, and it's sort of like um, this is Tom Waits quite about. Um, songwriting, he says he'll have loads of little ideas and stuff, and he'll he'll leave them in his shed at the bottom of the garden, which is his studio. Um, and he shuts the door, and they, and there's like the little kids, and they all sort of and they all breed. And when he comes back, there's like loads of them, and it's all certain things have really flourished, and certain things have died. And and like you know, we could go in and do it all tomorrow, but when when you when you when you write a song. Certain songs you just forget about, and certain songs increasingly take on significance and just don't go away. And I think that's the most important stage, really, because I think anybody can just rattle them off. Mm. But it's it's what it what it's what ends up ends up meaning something to you. Well, can we can we translate that to OK Computer? Do you think if you went in after touring uh, now for the last couple of years and playing that material, do you think if you went in and recorded those songs now, it'd sound markedly different? from the album it would sound dreadful it would sound absolutely awful because um there's there's only a certain time where you should record a song um and then and then you should never record it again because um you just you're always from then on going through the motions it's sort of i guess it's like if you're a writer you wouldn't you wouldn't write the same book over and over again you know it, it, it's a different, a completely different thing. Recording it, sort of, you're, you're finding some, you're finding things out about yourself while you're doing it, 
and then and then it's over and then it's somebody else's forever more and all you do then is like if people want to hear you play it again then you'll play it for them because they're giving you something you, they're giving you a reason to play the song again There's, but otherwise it's, it's pointless because you just get bored of the material and you get you don't understand the sentiment of it because that you only understand the sentiment of, I, I mean like 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 let down for example that song when we recorded it um we were already just at the point when we were bored of it and we just managed to sort of get a version down which doesn't quite reveal the fact that we're almost bored of it um and then i had a complete nightmare personally to do for doing the vocal for it because i was bored of it and you know i couldn't get it together and i didn't understand the song and it was only because the others weren't as bored of it as i was <laughs> that, that that we managed to get it together you know and um and like now i think and i guess it's a year or so since we, since we finished it or whatever um now i kind of like it you know because now i have a distance on it now i understand it All right, listen, we've got you to also uh, select your high five as well. Um, uh, I, it's, it's a mystery to me. I have no idea what you're going to select, what you're going to play. Obviously, some of your all-time favourite music, I hope. Um, so, we're going to dedicate, you know, the next wee while on the J-Files to your favourite music. So, where do you want to start? I think I want to start with Prince Buster, actually. Which one? I think uh, this is my favourite album to wake up to. Um, if, you, if, if, if I've got a screaming hangover or... or you know, feeling low or whatever. Um, I just put on the first track of a, a greatest hits compilation, Prince Buster, which is Madness. Okay, and you play this one when you are you hung over much usually? Do you find? I, I'm <coughs> trying to cut down. <laughs> <laughs> he says it with a smile on his face. Let's hear it right now. Tom York from Radiohead is with us. Uh, 1960s uh, big sort of uh, influence on the ska scene, wasn't he? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I find this whole American ska thing just such so offensively shit. You know, just blows my mind. Oh, it's so funny, you know, you being English. I mean, we, you know, the ska scene in Australia hit at the same time as it hit in the UK back in the early 80s, and it has been weird to see America sort of pick up on it so many years down the track. Yeah. Uh, is it as strong, tour you touring around the States? Is it really noticeable? Do you think it's a really strong scene over there? Well, it seems to be, but, um, I mean, as far as I can work out, it's completely soulless. Except, like, the, the young skate kids doing it is fair enough, right? But like the thirty-somethings playing ska music and stuff, and like, you know, getting signed and and why, you know, I, I don't get it. I'm sorry, just I mean it's just me. I don't get it. You know, when, when, when um, it seemed to me when the ska thing was was invented, is that like you know they, like Prince Buster was was voicing all, all these really insane things as part of his culture, you know, and and the American culture is so utterly barren. But to, but to put it in the context of ska music, you know, I, well, that's just me. That's what I think. You know, it's like, you know, I, I don't, I, it doesn't wash with me, you know. It doesn't wash with me in some white boy, you know, playing ska music like that. It didn't even wash, the only time it ever washed with me really was the specials. Like, you know, we're all specials freaks when we were kids. I'm digging myself a hole, I don't care. I'll probably get hate man. Oh, well, I know, the specials are totally cool still. Well, yeah, but they were like writing their own material and they made, they did something with it, you know, and the beat, they they really did something with it, you know. And they, they truly, really tried to reinvent it and make it their own. But these boys, like, man, fuck, you know, they're about as rude boy as I am. Okay, Prince Buster there with Madness, uh, the first in Tom York's High Five, uh, radio hit in the country at the moment. We're featuring him tonight on the J-Files. Uh, track number two for you, Tom. Okay, hang on, I'll just flick through. So you've got a great selection here. I'm just looking at them so. Neil Young Smith. I uh, can't find the Neil Young. I've lost it. Oh no. Ah, uh, oh, Dr. Octagon. Oh man, they don't have the titles. Shit. Um. Um. Oh, Blue Flowers. Blue Flowers. Do you know that one? No, I don't know this one. Okay, yeah. I've heard of. Do tell me a little bit about Dr. Octagon. I know the name. Um, James Lavelle, who runs Mo Wax. Do you know the Mo Wax? Um, he sent me the Dr. Otkin, he sent me Blue Flowers, um, and uh, I just thought it was genius. I, it, it makes me absolutely cry with laughter. The guy, the guy, the, the guy who wrote the, he, he was so high when he did it. It's brilliant. It's fucking great. 
How does he create music? I know you're a big fan of uh, DJ Shadow. Is Dr. Octagon something similar? Oh, no. I mean, he's much more... It's kind of old-school hip-hop, but not... You know, the main, the main, the main sample in Blue Flowers is, is, is this gorgeous string section um, thing. Oh, it's, it's really amazing. Um, how much input uh, do you have into what the directors actually do to the songs that you've created? Um, it varies wildly, really. Um, sometimes you just get a script in and, and you don't, you just don't, it's amazing, it, you know, it's exactly right and that's the end. When we did, um, Paranoid Android, I couldn't find anything that, 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 you know, any, anybody's work that I thought in any way came close to the mood of the song, except for this, while we were finishing off the album, um, I had like a collection of, um, Magnus Carlson's, um, Robin cartoons, right? And I just thought we just watched them all the time and it was just totally where our heads were at. In the end, you know, I just sort of asked him to to do a Robin cartoon because that that was it, that, you know. And the, the weird thing was the way he, that he interpreted it was, was, it was so uncanny. It was because he didn't want the words of the song, right? He doesn't understand English very well. And he, and he sat and he listened to it all day um, on repeat on his CD player, um, constantly, all day, and then, you know, writing down images as he was seeing them in his head and put them together and faxed it back to us, and it was just weird. It was, it was like the whole story of the, you know, the whole story of the actual song anyway, and the reason it was written. So, sometimes you just have things like that where people just respond in such a weird way. And then the, the latest one, we did No Surprises, has been done by Grant, who's been following us around. And he was, you know, he was sort of seeing the other things that were coming up. That, that, and a lot of the, the scripts for No Surprises were the same old thing, like a lot of um, No Surprises, like um, I'd be walking down the street and cars are blowing up and everything's going off and I have this completely deadpan reaction and it's all like... And it's, it's all pretty much the same. And then, and then we had this other script <laughs> where I was going to... Uh, I was going to fly out of a toilet. I was going to get into a toilet of an aeroplane and I was going to press the button to uh, flush the toilet and it was going to be the ejector seat. Right. Yeah. Um, and we were halfway down that and then we suddenly thought, mm, no, no, hang on. Great idea, but totally the wrong song. And then Grant just came up with this the weirdest idea of, of me just basically drowning myself with the titles rolling up. I've seen a portion of it. I haven't seen the whole thing, but it's you've got a space suit on or a space helmet on. It's, yeah, I mean it's sort of it's kind of in reference to that uh, to the 2001 bit, you know, with the helmet. It's a 2001 set when when the um, the lights are being reflected in the helmet. But we but Grant chose to sort of frame it in such a way that actually the television was the frame, mm. which which I got really excited about because I I like the idea of of maybe sort of walking into a bar or something and, and seeing seeing my head just framed by the television just like a goldfish bowl and then I drown and, and well, almost drown and I actually had to do that as well it was horrible it was terrifying for this video you had to do that as well? yeah there was no way of cheating it so I did have to actually be submerged in, in the water for um, a minute there was no other way of doing it so they built this helmet and filled it up with water with my head in it um, and I had a pull-out thing I could do, but, um, well, I mean... Are you mouthing the words at the same time, too? No, I just, no, I just, um, I'm just there for a minute, uh, uh, in a, in a, in a goldfish bowl full of water, basically. Goldfish? No, I don't know. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> and are you good at holding, <laughs> are you good at holding your breath? Uh, well, it was by the end of it, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah we had the stuntmen training me and everything. When we first started doing videos, every video director we ever met was was just a, a bullshitter and, and, and a and a sort of hangover from the eighties. Most of them were just sort of. We had guys who used to come. They used to come in and pretend they'd written a script, and then get us to come up with the ideas, and then repeat them back to us, and walk out thinking they'd sold us a video. And we were like, oh, they must think we're really out of our heads or something. Uh, Karma Police, I saw that one, and I kind of thought at the time, 
it won't be long before someone, a director, offers Tom a part in a movie. Have you had any offers yet? No, the best, the best, the, the best one is um, the Robin cartoon. Um, Magnus wants me to do the voiceover of Robin, <laughs> which is great, which means I don't have to sort of, because I can do that. I can't remember lines and um, uh, I'm not a very good actor in any way who would want to see me in a film. <laughs> Take one step back. Are you going to do that part? Yeah. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, you are. You're going to do that. Okay. Oh yeah, because that's great. That's just a voice. And so you have trouble remembering. I suppose you'd have trouble remembering other people's words. Do you have trouble remembering your own words on stage? Yeah. Terrible trouble. Do you write them down like Michael Stipe did a while ago, a few years ago? Well, he, he did because he. Yeah. No, but I don't because you just get in the habit of it. And you, you know. You, I don't have to do that, which is good. A discipline. Okay, Tom York from Radiohead. Uh, we're up to track number three. Okay. Um, no, that might kill you off. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I know which CD it was. Won't say a word. Oh, yeah, here we go. You've got to have one oh, of those. Oh, wow, yeah. Get the four wheel drivers to turn off. Um, <laughs> okay, what, what we want? Uh, Earth Died Screaming. Oh, this is Tom Waits' Bone Machine, which I just got out. And, um,. Oh yeah, Jesus is going to be here. This is this is amazing. I mean, I can hear him rolling down the lane. I said, Hollywood be thy name. <laughs> um, uh, he's he's just always been a complete inspiration to me. Um, and the thing that inspires me now is he he has his studio at the bottom of his, his garden apparently, and he does. I mean, he does he does a lot of other things. But I think it's just the, you know, he's. He's, as a songwriter and as a musician and a singer, he's, he's aged so disgracefully. You know, most people sort of end up, like, you know, going down the Elton John way, the, the, the blood sucked out of them, and, well, literally, in this case. Um, uh, and he <laughs> said so 70, was it blood transfusions? But anyway. Um, is that right? Anyway, I'm going to get sued now, aren't I? Uh, I'm not saying a word. Um, and disgracefully, you just said. Yeah, aged, aged, uh, utterly disgracefully. I mean, musically, you know, just got more and more and more off the fucking moor, and great. That's what you want, man. But he's still, he hasn't, he hasn't, you know, he's got that cult following who has stayed there. Yeah, and he's still, he's writing better songs than he ever did, as well. That's what blows my mind about it. That's why he's a constant inspiration to me. The idea that you, you know, it's all right. You don't have to lose it. You can actually get better. Like jazz musicians, they get better. Rock musicians get worse. The J Files. Richard Kings are with you tonight for another half hour. It's time to get back to Tom York, singer from Radiohead, with the fourth track in his high fives. I think it's going to have to be this one. Um, this is Neuer. Or Neuer, or Neuer, but Neuer. Said in a German, German accent. First track. Oh, I don't even know what it's called, man. It's not on the CD. Anyway, it's the first track on Neuer, and, and you'll know the one, because uh, it's this one. Oh, here we go. Oh, dear. Okay, this is this is um this is one we just listened to uh, constantly when we were on tour in Europe, and um, uh, it has a very very strange effect. I mean, if you're listening to this in a car, and you're 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 being able, you're driving along fast, you should you should turn this really up as loud as it possibly goes. Um, you know, even so, it's distorting. It's called Hello, Gallo, and it's ten minutes long. <laughs> Noi there on Triple J, uh, selected by Tom York of Radiohead. And you reckon that one, the full 10 minute uh, track from Noi there on Triple J, you reckon that one's for, for the, for the for, uh, what did you say before? The four, the, we're going to turn off the truck drivers, the four wheel truck drivers? I think the four wheel truck drivers have already turned off. I think that was. That was <laughs> That's not brought them back? <laughs> oh no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, tell me a little bit about this band. They're sort of uh, seen along with. Uh, can and craft work as, as being innovators in the German music scene. Um, how, how long have you been into their music and what does it do for you? Um, I've only got this album, you know, I don't know anything else by them at all. Um, uh, I, every time I go to like kraut rock sections which keep cropping up, to me it's sort of like, um, I mean I've got the Julian Cope book on kraut rock and it's really inspiring and you just, oh great, you know, and you want to go out and buy them. And I have to say some of them are a bit disappointing. But, um, it's just that, that um, there's a later track on this one as well, 
which which is just um I've never heard anything like it in my life. It was it was mind boggling. Again, I was listening to it on a motorway, and um, and there's a guy singing, but he's singing so quietly. It's like um, so quietly that it's just um, breath, right? But they recorded it incredibly loudly, so that that it's just horrible. It's like this spirit coming out of the walls at you, and you're, it's like you're hallucinating. You don't you don't you know you start seeing things just because the I mean, I've just never heard anyone do that before. It was, anyway. And so the effect's not great? Oh, no, it's brilliant. But it's completely upsetting. You know, it's not something you'd want to put on a lot. But anyway. Do you play a lot in the studio? Do you play around a lot with your vocals to finally get the, the sound that you like? Um, yeah, it's sort of... I'm not... I'm not you know, we weren't that confident. When, when we were doing the record, we, weren't, we were very much, you know, we need to stick to certain rules. Um, because, uh, you know, Nigel was sort of, Nigel Godrich was, was worried that I'd do it, because I would, when, when I was doing the vocals, I'd always, I'd usually do it first take, because then I'd lose it. <laughs> you really do get bored quickly, don't you? And, and, um, so he, he, he had to know that I, I'd got it, he, he got the right microphone in front of me in time. <laughs> <laughs> so, um... Um, but 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 now he sort of says he's he's much less worried about it now because um, you know it doesn't really matter as long as, as long as it doesn't matter what microphone you put in front of it or whatever. But anyway, I just thought the noise thing was a, it's just a really interesting idea and a very beautiful song as well. Okay, but um, but now we're going to listen to. So how many have we got left now that that was ten minutes long? Oh no no we've still we've got the five don't worry. Really? Cool. Okay well um um I just bought Tinder sticks. Uh, curtains. I'm a huge Tinder Sticks fan. Um, uh, a lot of people can't get get past his voice, but I think his voice is just just amazing, and I think it will get better as well. He seems to get more confident as well as about his um, the actual lyrics and everything. And them as a band, like the the confidence level, you know, um, it's just gone up, and it's just really inspiring to listen to. And um, uh, and this one particular track is sort of. It's just, uh, it's like an emotional black hole. It starts off and you just sort of think, well, okay, it's not really doing that much. And then suddenly, uh, it's terrifying. It's like going down a slide. And he, this string thing that just um, descends down. And what he's actually singing about as well. All right. Well, that was uh, that. Well, I've heard some of the Tinder Six Past stuff, but that that was an amazing track from their latest album, Curtains. Uh, thanks for selecting some of your favourite music. You want to go on for another fifteen, don't you? Started, man. Yeah, you're just getting warmed up. There's Velvet Underground in front of us. Charlie Mingus. New yeah, new Kristen Hirsch. We're playing a bit of that. Yep. Uh, the Meters, of course. One of the one of the great bands. Uh, the the last one I want to take actually is Charlie Mingus. Are you going to play another one? I think. Oh, we're going to make it six now, are we? Yeah, we're going to play. And why? Oh, I haven't had my phone. Is that I'm pretty. I'm, ta I'm counting him back. I'm pretty sure we've had we've had Tom Waits. Oh no. Oh, go on. Oh, go on. Well, I was preparing myself for you to play something off Bitches Brew, which is it was a fairly hefty record, and I I'd set aside a fair amount of the program. Okay. Well, so there's yeah. Well, you'd have to really. Um. But no. See, no. I can justify this, right? Because the only record since um. The only record since Bitches Brew that's had the same effect on me, right, is this Charles Mingus record. And it's called The Complete Town Hall Concert. And it's a long, very amazing story um, about how uh, uh, it was an incredibly ambitious project. He had two um, full jazz bands, um, saxes, tenor saxes, baritone, all fat. Um, and he was trying to score it out, and um, he was trying to record it, and there was an audience there, and it was total anarchy and that the album um the album finishes with booing and and uh t t it's it's all it was a complete disaster of a recording session but even so there's i mean i haven't last time i had um the first time i heard bitches brew i mean i started seeing things immediately right and um you know i wasn't on drugs or anything it was just straight away i was seeing things and it it really freaked me out i was like that doesn't make any, you know, I've never had that before. And, uh, you know, most people probably listen to this program that listens to jazz at all. You know, that's fine. But to me, it's like, you know, the thing about Miles Davis, 
which is brilliant. And the thing about this Charles Mingus album is, is to me, it's not jazz at all. It's rock and roll. You know, it's like, um, and the first track is the one I want to play, right? Which is Freedom Part One. And uh, listen out for this amazing baritone sax bit that just goes, bah, 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 and it just sounds like, uh, I don't know, it just doesn't, it's just, it's so funny. It's brilliant. <laughs> 